because everybody needs to learn what baptism, what water baptism is really about. And I, I want to talk to you just for a minute, kind of get your hearts ready, because uh, we're going to dunk you, and uh, we're going to have a great time. But I want you to be able to prepare your heart to the experience that's going to happen. Now, to the outer man, baptism is somebody leads you up the steps, somebody helps you into the water. This is the outward person thinking. And somebody gets you all seated in there, got the nice non-slip pad there. You sit down and you put one hand on your chest and one over your nose, and we're going to freeze you. You know, and then you're going to come out of the water. I'm just making fun. Yeah, I did. So here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you, when we get ready to baptize you, to have that kind of mindset. Cold water, and I hope you get this thing done. Because it has nothing to do with religion. It has something to do so precious. And make such a bold statement through your whole life. That baptism in water should be sacred. And something very holy. Holy just simply means set apart. A lot of people say, hey, be holy for I am holy, saith the Lord. Not what they think is, hey, man, I can't be holy. No. It just simply is the Greek word means to set yourself apart so God can fill your life. Amen? How many here remember the time when you fell in love with that woman you married or that man you married, right? How you prepared yourself. Now listen, how you prepared yourself, you thought about maybe you couldn't get off the phone or you're writing a little love letters. I mean, I went through a lot of that, you know. But you think about it, that's how God wants us to have a relationship with him. He doesn't want us to just date him. That's what happens. Christians get into trouble, then they go to God, oh, get me out of this one, I'll never bother you again. Liar. <laughs> You will too. God knows that. So instead, get to know him. He gets to know God so much. You know what God says? You'll become his friend. And you know, friends share things. Hello. The, the closer and the more friendly you get with God, the more God opens up and shares truths with you. Oh, the, the depth and the beauty of that relationship. It's so complete. So it isn't about preachers preaching at you. I don't ever want to preach at you. I'm going to preach up like a shower of water and whatever you catch raining down on you. Jesus says, now you are clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. But they had to catch what he said. You're a Christian because somewhere along the line you caught certain truths and you acted upon them. And then the enemy came right away and started harassing you about it. He put you with somebody, called your names, it was supposed to be a Christian, and now you're all bitter and it's hard for you to get to church. Or you have a marriage where each of, of you are correcting one another. Listen, in your marriage, you can't argue if one person just doesn't. Hello? Amen. Moving right along. I already ministered to most of you right now, so you can just go home and have baptism or whatever. All right, so good morning, church. This is the day who has made. Treat, treat every day as a new day. He's new every morning. His promises are new every morning. If you treat it every day as a new day, then you can let go of the yesterday if it was cr cruddy, and you can proceed on. The Bible says that we need to have hope. We need to have something to look forward to. If we don't, it'll make our hearts sick. So you don't, as a preacher, cut everybody's foundation from under their feet and tell them how bad they are. No, you give them the word of God and you pray that God helps them to understand so they can rise above themselves. You are in a cocoon. What do you mean? How many's ever seen a cocoon? What's in the cocoon? A caterpillar. And when it comes out of the cocoon, what happens? It flies away. You're in a cocoon, folks. And whether you know it or not, your body is that cocoon. 
And God, the real you, God wants to liberate the real you and bring you out of yourself. And in order for that to happen, he's got to get you into understanding the word and letting down your guard and realizing God is not your enemy. Say amen. All right, would you take your Bibles and go with me to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 12 through 15. Now, as you go, let me read my paragraph to you. The Word of God is so life-changing. When we understand it and then we believe in it, Christ begins to change our life. Today is a day just like that. If we approach God and are hungry like a young child to learn, God will not disappoint us. As we learn to surrender to him daily, God will begin to share and fellowship with you. Because we all carry around something, which baptism about, that repels God. <gasps> we have something that we carry around that repels God? And what do you think that might be? Flesh. Everyone go, flesh. Don't pitch yourself very hard. You see this? This is not your friend. This is, this is the thing that gets nervous whenever you're around the preacher. Your flesh. This is the thing that doesn't feel comfortable in the presence of God. And the Bible gives us a very quick cure to it. He says, come, present yourself before me and take your body as a living sacrifice and lay it on the slab. I'm going to do a sermon called, What Happens When We're on the Slab? <laughs> Should be a fun one. And we lay ourselves on the slab, of, it says, a living sacrifice. And God goes to work shutting our flesh down. Folks, whether you like this or not, I'm going to tell you a truth. The devil isn't your biggest problem. Raymond, the devil isn't your biggest problem. It's us, our flesh. It's been programmed and given a virus called sin. And baptism is all about what happens when we accepted Jesus Christ and what God actually did. And then what we do is we outwardly display through baptism in water what has actually happened to us in our spirit. But see, when you just bring your flesh to church, you won't be able to hear because the flesh shuts, has a shut-off button. Hello? It will shut itself down and you'll be thinking about lunch when I'm preaching. Now, I want to say this to you, and I please don't think anything, anything of me. But I spend all week long asking God what he wants and needs for you to know. My sermons aren't something I pull off the internet, okay, or borrowed from somebody. <laughs> or truths that God has built in me and my wife. And I say... <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, I say, Lord, what do you want the church to know? I says, I want them to know when they become born again, they are a child of God now, and they have a different set of family rules than they did when they were a sinner. How many have children? Okay, okay. remember the day when they were just little? Wasn't that a good time? And then bless their hearts, they got older. Mine turned into teenagers, and suddenly they thought I was weird. And dad grew stupid. Until they got out and away from the house, and all of a sudden they discovered, ooh, my folks actually knew what they were saying. I felt that way. So think about it. Young Christians, we get a hold of the truth. Maybe you went to a place, and you got hammered the Bible all the time. And you had almost no freedom at all. And then when you get out there, you throw it all away. And go back and get trumped. The devil has your number. The only way to keep him off of you is take the Jesus vaccine. Inject yourself with God and his truth every day. Find out what it really is and not just listen to the media. How many know the media really needs some help? Amen. You want to get depressed? Turn it on for about a half an hour. <laughs> So we don't look to the world, media world, media world. We don't look to others for advice because if you would do, you're going to be a messed up Christian. 
You go to God for advice. You go to God with prayer so he can actually zap you with the juices you need to be somebody of God and not stumble around and go, oh, Lord, I hope I can get through this day. No way. So let's get into this. Say amen, please, Carrie. So it's very important about water baptism and understanding the mindset and the positioning of our heart. It represents what happened to you when you became born again. So I'm going to explain it to you for a minute, and then we'll go into some more. You still got Colossians, don't you? (laughs) Okay, good. Don't leave. Okay, you see, when you get born again, this is the miracle. I hope you'll really listen. The Holy Spirit takes you and puts you into Jesus. Now, just imagine the silhouette, the silhouetting of it, okay? We're not talking about physical. We're talking about spiritual. When you get married, the scripture says God brings the, the spouse and joins you together. Your spirits become one. That's the real marriage. It's not two of you living together and hashing it out. <laughs> it's God joining your spirits together. So they're one. You think alike. Everything comes together because Jesus is the center of your marriage. <clears throat> now, I don't marriage counsel. I really had a hard time marriage counseling. Because if I tell a couple, this is what the word says, you need to do what it says, and you won't have to be back here. They go out, don't do what it says, and they come back. Oh, and so I said, hey, did you do what I actually asked you to do in the scripture? And they said, well, no. He says, well, how do you expect to get any better? Our, our counseling session's over with. Because people think the church is Jesus. We're not Jesus. We're just emulators of him. We're just lovers of him. We're not Jesus. Because if you start to act in Jesus' position, you're going to get burned out. You're going to be tromped down because people will wear you out. So they come to church. We hear the word. We apply the word in our daily life. We have a daily prayer so God can work out the little details in our life is sometimes they're very painful, like past hurts, memories that you want to get rid of. Can you say amen? Colossians now. Chapter 2, verse 12 through 15. Buried with him in baptism. Now, the word baptism means to be immersed into. Okay? All right? You're actually placed into the water and your whole body is covered. Okay, it doesn't mean sprinkle. Now, please, I'm not putting sprinkling down. Sprinkling is more of a dedication and a cleansing. But baptism is more of a statement and an eradication of what happened inside of you that you are separated from now on all the days of your life unto God. Say amen, somebody. So buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him also through the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and sins, that's why we don't walk in our old man, flesh man, in the uncircumcision of your heart, he has made us together with him alive, having forgiven you all trespasses. Say all trespasses. Now, the funny thing about trespasses is it's also the word sin. How many know that you were a sinner? Now you got saved, now you're a son of God. Sinning is something you boo-boo at instead of practice. Okay? Two, okay, you are a child of God, so therefore your father will treat you as a child of his. You are inhabited by God. So if you're inhabited by God, therefore if God did what he did in the Old Testament, swallowed them, you know, got after them because they were evil, he doesn't do that with New Testament sons of God. And that's what's not being taught In the church, they're not teaching you what you are as a child of God. And the example is everywhere. They're teaching you, you're so unworthy. You'll never amount to much. Oh, one of these days you'll go through all this. And and the idea behind it is to wear you out before you even arrive. (laughs) Satan's a master at religion. Religion was created by the flesh of man to try to appease God. The Old Testament law was given to show man that they can't live 
up to God. So a Messiah is to come, Jesus, that we would would accept like medicine into our hearts and that he and us together would cause us to grow up and to get out of this situation. Now, if you can't make peace with that, then you're going to have trouble all your life. And we want to minimize that trouble. Can you say amen? Amen. Buried with him in baptism, also raised with him in eternal life. And you being dead in your trespasses and in uncircumcision of your heart, you've been forgiven all your trespasses. Then he wiped out all the handwriting and all the requirements that Satan had against every one of us. And against us. And then he nailed it to his cross. Having nailed it to a cross, he having disarmed the principalities and powers. Everyone say principality and power. That's what works around us. That's the devil's group, okay? A principality is the Greek word archon, which means lizard man. Hello? What was Satan in the garden? See, people are so religious, they don't look up what the meaning of things are. An archon is a lizard. Hello? It's a lizard. I got a really neat video I'd like to show some of you daring people what the, the lizard looked like in the garden and what he's doing now. Ooh. But you know what? I just laugh because, hey, he's having a circus. We're having God. He's having junk food, and we're feeding on the feast of the Lord. Not working? Headphones. Anyway, let's go on. So it goes on to this. Having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements, everything Satan could accuse you, God wiped them out. So guess what? You are acquitted. You've been to court, you accepted Jesus, and all your sins and trespasses are forgiven. So Satan is still accusing you, but you're acquitted. Now the neat thing about this, and where Christians don't understand is they have to go, the Satan has to go through God to get to you. If you're walking with God and talking with God like you're supposed to be, and you can do it very easy, a child can do it, even a caveman, Satan can't get to you unless he draws you out into yourself and gets you thinking about your problems again. I just said that two people needed to hear that. Thinking about your problems. Thinking about your problems. Where's your eyes? On us. On me. Okay. Take a big breath. Let's go to our first point. (laughs) All right. By the Holy Spirit, we all were baptized into one body. Look around you. We're all different color, different eyes. Huh? Some of us have different upbringing than others. We're a variety of good people, aren't we? And yet, when we accept Jesus Christ, God says, you're not different, you're all one. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see a black man or a white man. He sees a God man. You're the one that draws attention. Don't you know? Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You might not like it, but I was catering years and years ago in my large, I had a huge church. And we had a bunch of bikers for Jesus. And I decided one day to make a parking spot for them down there in Pacific and Algona. So I met with the head guy and says, look, you guys, you know, you're riding in everything like that. Instead of having your bikes all scattered around, would you like to have a spot where you could just nicely park them? And the first thing he said to me, this is just how people get. We get so paranoid of one another. He says, you're being prejudiced. I said, what? Yep, you're catering to us bikers. I said, no, Jesus is. You see how we're programmed? We're programmed to take offense. Get that off your shoulder. Listen, if if you called me every name in the book, you're not going to change how I love God or you. If you say one day, Pastor, would you become my friend? I will become your friend. But my friendship's not based on your performance or how good you can be as a friend. It's based on the fact that you love God and I'll be your friend. You asked me to. So I'm not looking for you to perform or not perform. And in your marriages, you better stop doing that. Boy, we've done had church, haven't we? 
Amen. Because Satan wants us to see difference all the time and not see unity. He makes us indifferent. Yes. How many here drink Coca-Cola? Come on. Coca-Cola. How many here drink Pepsi? How many here don't care? But I'm a Pepsi man. But I'm, I'm not anti-Coke. But you can look at that. Indifference and prejudice. That's how stupid we get. And listen, do you know what the word being, what's that word everybody throws around? You are a racist. Well, if you were in India, you would be a, they operate in classes. You're a classist. Because Satan, listen, Satan doesn't care what divides us up. He just wants us to divide it up. He don't care what you like or what you don't like. And God doesn't either if you love him. But the only people that are, are, are so sensitive about themselves have been sitting around thinking about themselves for months, maybe years. You're supposed to be dead. You can't irritate a dead man. Hello. Be upset, dead man. You see, Christians, you've been taught religion, not God. And so we're going to change that with you. But you got to pay attention. Those with ears, let them hear. I'm going to tell you one more thing, and you might not like it, but Satan will keep you from coming here. You can go to any church you want. He won't bother you. If you come to here where you hear the pure word being taught, not because I teach it, because it's taught here, and he's going to keep you from here. This little teeny church on the edge of town. Huh? And it's more prestigious to go to a giant church where the four or five bathrooms and all that. Yeah, I'm sure it is. And you don't know God. You're just coming for the entertainment. No. You're coming to sit at the feet of God and become his friend. All right. So, by the Holy Spirit. All right, 1 Corinthians 12, please, verses 12 through 14. By the Holy Spirit, we all are baptized into one body. Suddenly, we're not any different. We're all one. You got me? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. One time I had red juice in my cup there, so much, really red. I dipped it up and my nose got on it. Everybody thought it was a red nose, you know. Rudolph the Red. Okay, anyway, so I'm just trying to buy you time to get there. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all members are of the one body. Being many are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all immersed into, baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Greeks, whether we be slaves or free, whether we be white or black, red or yellow, and have all been made to drink into the one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member only, but a variety of personalities. Can you look at the good of everybody? Can you enjoy the gifts that God has given them? Now, I might be covered up by a lot of hurt and pain, but everybody has good gifts. Everybody has great things inside of them. Are you with me? So a couple of points I want to give you. In the new birth, as well as in water baptism, the water symbolizes God and being submerged into him. So get that picture. Two, the body of Christ has many different types and members, but in Christ we are of one in God. He doesn't notice any difference. So why should you? Hello. Why should you? Satan's master programming dissent and division. Thirdly, the moment you surrender to Christ, you were separated from the world like the Red Sea separated the Israelites from the armies of the Egyptians. And then it closed in on them. So, baptism, water baptism and being born again separates you from the world. You're under a new family rules. 
And these family rules are not taught in the church like they need to be. How many ever gone to a good church? There's good churches all around. Please, I'm not bad. But you go to the church and you get a 20-minute sermon and it says, do this, do this, do this, do this, and this should be your results. How many have seen it? Come on. I'm not putting anything down. Just listen to me. Do you know what that is? It's psychology. It's not the gospel. It's psychology. It's suggesting you do this. Now, how are you going to do this without him? It's just the same as the commandments. How are you going to do any of them without God in you? You can't. Are you with me? Eyes up here, please. All right. Fourthly, we are to be totally submerged as Moses stepped down in the into the water, they parted, they went underneath on dry land, and then the water came up, swallowed the Egyptians, separated the world from the Israelites. Can you see him? A type of baptism. All right, my next point is we are one in Christ. Say one. one. So next time, don't draw attention to your color. Here, we don't know you as color. We just know you as a good person. And you're sitting there with all these gifts. But you're thinking how others are thinking about you. Who gave you that piece of information? Stop thinking about what others are thinking about you. You need to be thinking what God is thinking, how you're aligning up with him, and then he's there to help you. People come into church, and they're on guard. Ooh, the pastor looks kind of squirrely. Hey, I'm solid. Just ask my wife. All right. All right. Galatians chapter 3, 26 through 28. Listen, we are one in Christ, seated in him. Everyone say, I'm sitting down in Jesus. Do you know how it works? When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you, by the Holy Spirit, get placed into Christ. The first thing you're supposed to do is sit down. Shut up. Don't talk so much. And learn. The Bible said we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So we accept Jesus. The Holy Spirit puts us into Christ. And he says, now, stop doing everything. Stop thinking for him. Sit down and learn. Didn't Jesus say, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest? Come, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and I'm lowly. I'm easy to be entreated. And you will find rest to your souls. And I tell you what, if you've ever had a troubled mind, that's how to cure it. With Jesus, with God. Are you with me? He says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you were that were baptized into Christ, born again, you have put on Christ. In other words, God clothed you with him. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, there's a big one, and you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now listen, in the beginning, how many here remember the book of Genesis? And somehow Adam and Eve committed sin, right? So when God showed up to visit with them, what were they doing? They were hiding. Listen, when you do something wrong, don't hide from God or stay away from church. God knew it the moment you thought about it. Now did it. And he's still loving you. Come on, let's get it fixed. Let's get it fixed. Well, we're hiding in the bushes. Not only that, but they covered themselves with fig leaves, didn't they? We always want to cover ourselves. It's called excuses. Don't make excuses. Don't cover yourself. Just say, yeah, I did blow it, and I am so sorry. And God says, good, let's deal with it. Boy, that was tough, wasn't it? Satan pounds your mind. It's going to be like the old days when you did something wrong. Your dad grabbed something and bashed you or whatever. Come on. We're talking about God here. So when Adam and Eve committed high tree, they were hiding in the bushes. They covered themselves with fig leaves. That was the first thing God did. He covered them, didn't he? He sacrificed an animal, shed the blood. Now, you guys need to understand this. 
and then he covered them with the animal skins, symbolizing a type of what happens when you get born again. God covers you with the blood over your sin, and then he clothes you, not with an animal skin, with the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Robes of righteousness. Put on the armor of praise. Come on. Right? It says, as you see the day approaching, put on the armor of light, the Lord Jesus Christ. You are covered with blood and light. And yet you can't see it, but the devil can. That's why he waits to see you slip out of that and into your devious little things you like to do nobody else finds out about. Stop doing that. If you have a little habit and stuff like that, it's already known. Don't run around and brag about it. Just do your thing and ask God for help. Don't get all upset. It's like the kid get caught with his hand in the cookie jar and you say, was your hand in the cookie jar? <laughs> no. Bread comes all over their mouth. <laughs> Listen, I can see in you. I scared a guy the other day. He was trying to tell me who he wasn't, you know, kind of brag and everything. But I could see who he was in a gentle way. And so he was going through all this, and I just looked at him. I said, you know, I can see you. He just shut right up, just freaked him right out. <laughs> see, God gives you special eyeglasses when you hang out with him so that you can see if trouble comes way off. And stop it. Can you say amen? And concerning you, pastors are like parents. Whether female or male, they care for their children. They care for who God gives them. So one thing, I'm never going to sit around and pick on you nor discuss you. I'm going to believe the best for you. You got a problem? Discuss it. Let me give you some scriptures. Let God be God. Can you say amen? Here's the point. When we are baptized into Christ... He surrounds us. Amen? That's why we go to God on a daily basis, so he keeps us surrounded because we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We're walking through a fallen, corrupted planet. So you need to walk in faith, walk in trust, and you need to know that Satan doesn't, doesn't have the key to your back door. All right. Say, so not my back door. Amen. Unless you give it to him. I've fallen. And you open all the shutters and the windows. Come and give me. I have fallen. It's my in blood. Shut that mess up. Who told you that lie? It's not in scripture. And the reason that I'm saying this right now is I'm wedging a devil off you who's lied to you all your life. You're never going to be anything. You're always going to be this. That's a lie from the pit. Somebody smile at somebody and say amen. amen. All right. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 18. I was talking with uh, my nephew earlier today about knowing no man after the flesh. Okay. All right. So therefore, from now on, now that you're born again, we know no one according to the flesh. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 18. Even though we have known Jesus after the flesh, yet we know him not like that anymore. We know him in the spirit, don't we? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, how many people are in Christ? He is a new creation. Old things, your flesh and all that is dying away. And all things are becoming new in your spirit. Why? Because when you got born again, God came in to live in you, right? But that's not all that happened. We're going to do it in baptism. He took out the fallen nature out of your spirit. Let's say you had a little bit of poison in your spirit. God just came right on in, removed that poison. His spirit and your spirit now mingle and become one. So the scripture says you are a new creature or a God creation now. We're not living from the out man. We don't know no man after our flesh. I don't look to you as your flesh. Hello, I look to your spirit. I can see in your spirit the condition of what you're thinking, what you're not, when the anointing's on me. Nobody's mad at me, right? 
Okay, good. Because I get to baptize you later. But I want you to know that our Christianity, what we have been experiencing, is far short than what God wants to, us to experience with him. Amen. Can I have an amen for that? Amen. All right, so listen. So you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things in your spirit have become new. Now all things are of God when you walk with him who has reconciled us to himself. In other words, he made friends. There's nothing separating us from God. You just can come right to him through Jesus Christ and has given us a ministry causing others to come to God. Reconciliation. Say, I got it. Now turn to your Bible and go with me to Romans chapter 8. Oh, excuse me, Romans chapter 6, 3 through 8. I'm almost done. Yay. I want to tell you that the word of God is a sharp, two-edged sword. And when I share it, I don't say, oh, yeah, this person has a problem, so I'm going to share and hit him with the word. No, please, that's what the devil says. The devil will sit right on your head in a sermon like this and says, you're being singled out. Sure, that's how he always gets you to miss what you need to hear. Thinking of yourself, you see. Got to know the tricks. I became a really snotty nosed little brat when I was a kid every time I didn't get my way. When we become adults, we're supposed to have shed that. Can you say amen? We're supposed to shed our old man because that's the one that gets us in trouble. That's the one that comes up with the idea that nobody loves me, nobody cares about me. Amen. So let's go on. Dead to sin, but alive to God. That's you. Say, I'm dead to sin, but I'm alive to God. I'm dead to sin in my flesh, and I'm alive to God in my spirit. You mean it. That's exactly where you're at. Now, listen what it says. What was the question was, shall we continue to keep sinning that grace may abound? God forbid. And then he says... Or do you not know as many as us that were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? Say amen. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. You see the newness? Walk from the inside out, not from the outside in. Because if you walk from the outside in, you're going to be guarded. You're going to... You're going to be talking about your colors and all that kind of stuff because you're focused on yourself and not on the Lord. Remember, God doesn't recognize colors of skin. He only recognizes hearts towards him. So stop bringing it up to everybody. Everybody knows you're special. Stop talking about it. All right. So I love this. Okay. Therefore, being buried with him for baptism, we're also raised with him to the glory of the Father in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Say amen. amen. Knowing, this know, that our old man was crucified with him. See, that's the baptism of water. That's what happened to you when you got born again. And the body of sin might be done away with. Say, the body of sin might be done away with. Everyone say, the body of flesh. Get out of the way. So every day when you go to God and you talk to God, he permeates your flesh and gets it out of the way. So you don't get up from prayer and be a jerk to your wife. Or you get up in prayer and you get all upset and yell at the kids. That time in prayer, focusing, it's like your cell phone. Plug it in, buggy, before you run out of juice. Or you're going to find out that you're going to need a plug-in place in your car and every place you sit in your house. Because you're that unorganized. Plug in first thing every day and get God's charge. Say, oh, me. I want to read something to you in the message. I'm going to read the same passage, but first let me make these points. One, we are buried with Christ. Say amen. So if we are buried with Christ, you should not be living your, for yourself. Why? 
what are you doing, Pastor? I'm letting you think about that. Because every time we live for ourselves, being a Christian, when we're living for ourselves, we mess things up. Have you figured that out yet? Even the best of you, some of you are so talented. Man, I wish I had that talent. You'll mess up every time thinking you're all that. So you go to God, humble yourself, let God juice you up in the spirit. You go out there and be the best that you can be. If you're a carpenter, be the best. If you're a cook, be the best. If you're a servant, be the best. Why? Because God then is glorified and people's eyes learn to lift off of you because they know you're consistent and your life glorifies God. Say amen, someone. All right, so this next passage of Scripture, this is from the Message Bible. It's the same passage we just got through reading from the King James. I need to say this to you. The Message Bible is what we call in modern language. I don't recommend you read the Message Bible as a study Bible. You take a King James, New King James, NIV, New American Standard, are all fine. But the Message Bible puts it in almost street language and common language to help and caught to encourage the pitcher. Okay? Now, there are other books. Did you know besides the Bible? Here we go. <laughs> if they don't line up with the Bible, they're not worth anything. But there are some books that support Scripture. Those are okay. Book of Enoch is one of those. Okay? The book of Jasser. Huh? Amen. And the book of Jubilee were really actually written by godly men. Now, some of the other ones are whacked. You know, you want to read about what baby Jesus did to the bears and the kids when they crossed them? They all died. He zapped them. I mean, this is not a superhero costume. You know what I'm saying? But there are things in the book of Enoch and Jasher and some that gives us a little more description. So they're help books. That's all they are. Not to change the meaning of the Bible, but they help us understand, you know, like Enoch, he describes what the angels did when they fell. You know, the Bible just covers it briefly, but he describes it, talks about the pact that they made, where they came down, how the, the Nephilim are buried in Antarctica. Well, we'll just move on past that. I hope you get curious, man. I'm just sitting around with all this information. And we're being religious. All right, so let's go on. Here's what it says in the message. Same scriptures. Romans chapter 6, 1 through 6. It says, so what do we do? Keep on sinning that God keep on forgiving us. Some of you, that's where your life is. You, you go and you fall and you go and you fall. Hey, keep going. Don't stop. Hello? But certainly, don't run around pick on other people's faults. Well, he's this and they're that. Because you're going to fall even more. And this time, you might get skinned up. So don't pick on the body of Christ. Leave it alone. It's God's property. Say amen. Be reverent and be respectful. It's part of the family. <laughs> Are you doing okay, brother? I'm so glad you're here. Amen. You look so concerned. Amen. <laughs> I would, hey, I want a pie. I, I, that's because I love you. The first time I ever met you, you had a pie in your hand. That's why I love you. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Well, you know, when pastors personal like this, everybody goes, what's he want? What's he seeing me? What's he, what's he want? You see what the devil's done to you? You can't even open your heart up because you're so paranoid. Stop it. All right. I'm still on message. Listen. Okay. What should I do then? Should I continue to sin? I hope not. If we've left the country where sin was resident and sin was the sovereign there, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize we packed up, we left there for good? That is, what happened in baptism? You left the old house and you came into a new country in a new house. And when we went under the water, we left the old country, the sin behind. And when we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace. See how beautiful that's put? 
a new life, and a new spirit. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we are lowered into the water, it's like the burial of Jesus. And when we are raised up out of the water, it's the life, the resurrection of Jesus. Like uh, each one of us is raised into a light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we're going in our new grace, sovereign country that we live with rules and independence. Amen. Could it be any clearer? Why, if we're born again, are we living comfortably in our flesh? If you were so happy, why do you get stoned? Now, come on now. God's watching. I'm not going to condemn you what you do. But don't kill yourself in doing it. But we, we hide off and we go do this because there's a void missing in here. So we try to fill it with chemicals or something. And we're never satisfied because the only thing that can fill the void in our hearts is our relationship with God on a daily basis. That's the only thing that can. It makes us nicer. It makes us happier. It gives us vision. It lets us to know what we do on the job that's good and what we shouldn't do. It helps us in such a way that our life takes on the beauty and the glory of God. All right. Last thing I want to share with you is when a person is baptized, notice that they're outside of the tank. Can you say amen? And then we walk you up to the tank, up the stairs, and we have you get into the tub, and we have you sit down and prepare yourself. All of that has significant meaning. Number one, when we are coming into the water, it is a testimony that you're leaving the world and the sin oh, and you're turning your back on it and you're walking up and you're going into the water and you're ready to be submerged into God. Now, I'll ask you some questions. I says, you're here to be baptized and be separated unto God. Is there anything you want to renounce? Yes, I renounce sin. I renounce the world and its destruction of my life. Is there anything that you would like to proclaim? I proclaim Jesus is my Lord and that God will help me all the days of my life. Okay, so we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Encompass all the kingdom. And then in the name of Jesus, I'm going to baptize you. We'll get you all under. And then you'll come up out of the water. Now, when you're in the water, pause for just a moment or two. Don't go, oh, water's cold. That's just what the enemy wants you to do. No but Jesus is warm. I was baptized in Ipset Creek in Buckley when there were ice on the sides, along with 20 other people. And you know what? I went in cold, but I came out warm. So when you come out of the water, pause. Open your heart. Don't let the earth, don't let the feeling of water pull you away from your relationship at that moment from God. If you have something you want to be delivered, like smoking, drinking, or something you feel has really taken over your life, you can give it to God and he'll remove it. If you're not spirit-filled and got your freeness of your language, you can come out of the water speaking in tongues. I don't know if you know who Bo is, but Bo is a, somebody I discipled and baptized at Puyallup Foursquare. He came out of that water speaking in the language and prophesying. It was just amazing. So lots of things can happen. Don't go in the water with a preconceived, constricted idea. Go in the water. God, here I am. Take me. Here I am. Take me. He could take you on a vision. He could show you something. Don't limit him. That's why your walk is so hard because you're limiting God. Okay? Just say, God, help me just get all limits off. Say amen, somebody. If you got somebody that we give the Lord a praise.